Hi, everybody. Welcome to um, tonight's event. Uh, this is the first in a series of events being organised uh, this academic year around the theme of um, haunts. Uh, and uh, tonight's event um, is presented uh, to you in conjunction with the um, Centre for Contemporary Legend, uh, uh, alongside um, the organisation that I um, uh, represent, which is the um, Sheffield Hallam University Space and Place Group. Um, so in the uh, eight presentations that we have for you uh, this evening, uh, we're going to be taking a tour of uh, multiple perspectives, multiple angles on the issue uh, of how uh, places are formed through processes of haunting, whether um, uh, ghostly or in other senses of haunting, perhaps haunting through practices um, something that I'll try and explain in a short, very short introductory talk in a moment. Um, both of those senses of haunting, though, um, are, are in tension with um, the sort of contemporary cultural urge to put things into their rightful place, that in certain um, milieu it's appropriate and uh, indeed encouraged to talk about ghosts uh, as an aspect of, of, of folklore and um, um, aesthetic experience, um, but much less so appropriate to speak about ghosts and haunting uh, and matters of um, spiritual contamination uh, within the context of sort of professional encounters with place. And that's something that we seek to um, somewhat challenge uh, this evening with a blend of talks uh, that we're going to be presenting um, to you. Um, but thinking about haunting, conventionally we'd be thinking about the role of stories, the way in which they bind people to places, make those places meaningful um, and persistent, uh, the way in which there are traces of the past, uh, ideas that are picked up upon, uh, that we carry forward into the present and onward into the future, uh, that we are haunted by stories and that stories help us make place. Um, that it's a fundamental part of the way in which we live in the present, that we have these uh, connections uh, taking us back through into the past and casting our anxieties forward into the future. Um, the reason I come into this um, topic as someone whose day job is uh, helping to teach the next generation of real estate professionals um, is that I've spent quite a few years thinking about hauntedness in its broadest sense of uh, that attachment to cues being given at places that tell people how those places should be perpetuated and presented uh, onward uh, from the present into the future through the shaping hand of um, the past. Um, and one place I sort of really noticed this at was in a um, country pub that I happened to walk my dog uh, past uh, over a sequence of many years. And during that period of time, I would see the comings and goings of different owners of this country pub with its exterior beer garden known as the paddock. Um, and each owner would, would put up their own new versions with a new glossy logo, but with the same wording, the same warning notices up on to these fences. Uh, and so I figured that there must be some real story as to why this paddock was seen as such a risky place that needed so many signs and what have yous. Um, and I eventually went along and, and, and interviewed the publican uh, or the publican who was in there as part of this sort of succession of publicans over a period of time that I was watching this pub. And what really struck me about what he told me um, was that he had no concerns about this area of grass space. He was simply aware that as a publican, you must anchor into um, picking up on and perpetuating the traditions, the arrangements, the styling um, that you step into when you arrive at a pub. You inherit all of the um, ways of doing, all of the um, artifacts that are arranged within the pub to give it that authentic character. You, those need to be arranged in a certain way for people to react to that pub in an appropriate manner. And so therefore there's this guiding force uh, caused by the past and by past arrangement and this urge to perpetuate through practice uh, a particular manner of arrangement of place that struck me as a wider sense of haunting um, that affects how places are presented to the world, how they perpetuate across time and how they influence those who 
in a sort of an iterative sense, pass through those places as temporary custodians of those places, but who in thinking that they are controlling those places are actually in turn controlled to some degree by the places themselves. So it's that notion of something being part and parcel of a place that lingers there in a multitude of sort of touchable and intangible cues uh, that really interests me. And I think we'll get some flavour of that uh, with some of the contributions today that seek to broaden out the discussion um, from the spectral uh, into this notion of, well, how is it affecting how we think about place and how places move forward, perhaps through successions of uses and after uses. Um, uh, that is the concern, for example, of me and my colleagues from a real estate point of view. So let's uh, let's get on and uh, join in with the presentations and uh, let's line up the first uh, presentation now. I'm going to share again. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Okay. I can you see the butterflies? Yeah, yeah, yeah. lovely. Yeah. Okay, just just checking because I'm not sure what I'm trying to do here. Okay, so I'm. Um, I'm going to tell you a bit about the butterflies and the, the, the monarch butterflies and a bit of the relationship with what happens in Mexico and how they are related to this particular season in the year. So I think the first thing that um, I want to say is that the Aztecs admire the butterfly, the monarch butterflies, and they call them Quetzal Papalot, which basically means the sacred butterfly the messengers of the woods. They associated the, the, the monarch butterfly to Xochiquetzal, who was the goddess of beauty, love, and flowers. The Aztecs believed that the monarchs announced the arrival of the sounds of the souls of the departed to the land of the living. And I think a bit of this comes from the fact that the uh, monarchs uh, do a very, very amazing migration uh, uh, process. And each autumn, millions of monarch butterflies leave their summer breeding grounds in the northern uh, US and Canada and travel over 3,000 miles to reach their winter grounds in the mountains in the central Mexico. Once there, the monarchs huddle together by the millions on the branches of the Oyamel fir trees. Um, and the butterflies arrive to the roasting sites in November where they remain in the roost during the winter months and then they begin their northern migration back to the, uh, Canada in March. Uh, the monarchs return to their remote forest sanctuaries um, in, in Mexico during the Dia de Muertos, the three-day span from the 31st of October to the 2nd of November, when the, some of the Christian holidays happen, like the Holos Eve, All Saints Days and All Souls Day, all together, they are celebrated collectively as the Day of the Dead. Um, since pre-Hispanic times, um, the Purépecha peoples, the, the, the original cultures from, from the sites where they were, they consider um, the butterflies sacred. So they used to um, receive them with offers from, um, of copal and, and, and wax. Um, they have as I said, since pre-Hispanic times, they have recorded their arrival um, they, of the flowing cloud of orange winged um, butterflies that pours into the Sierra Madre Hills at precisely the same time each year. They believe that human souls do not die, but rather they continue living in Mictlan, a place for spirits to rest until the day of the day of the year when they can return to um, visit their relatives in, in Earth. Later on, as Catholic traditions intermingled with the indigenous cultures, the monarch butterflies came to be regarded as the souls of the departed ancestors returning on Earth for their annual visit. Dia de Muertos is a big celebration where both the living and the dead are the main actors. And more than just a celebration, the Day of the Dead is a dialogue with the other life, with those who have gone before us. It is an act of communication with our dead relatives who are our roots, our identity, and our point of equilibrium between Earth and the rest of the cosmos. We feel we must not let the souls of our dead fade away. 
And just finally, according to the Purepecha belief, if you see a monarch on the day of the dead, keep quiet. Let fluttering brings, uh, let the, keep quiet and let the fluttering brings to you that message from a beloved one that has passed away. Thank you. Thanks, Elizabeth. I'm now going to read a poem from a small collection I've written um, inspired by the life of the Mexican artist Frida Kahlo. This is the last poem in the collection and it's called On the Sinist of Nights, which is a reference to Day of the Dead, which Elizabeth has just mentioned. It's written in the voice of Frida after her death as if she's returning to earth with the monarch butterflies. The other thing to mention is um, at the end of the poem, there are some references to clothing. And this is because um, Frida married the celebrated muralist and artist Diego Rivera. And at that point, she started wearing traditional Mexican dress. So the poem makes reference also to her celebrated way and flamboyant way of dressing. On the thinnest of nights, I will tiptoe down to the towering firs. Meet souls who've migrated through thick sea mists to fold brown wings and hang clustered like autumn leaves. Their trance is deep, more precious than long feathers. They wait for the warm breath of gods. You will know me among them. I will wear a Tehuana skirt, my red boots. Thank you. Yeah, sorry, what I was saying there before I forgot to turn my microphone on. Um, if anybody would like to um, pose any questions, please do so via the chat. Um, we're going to sort of have a couple of moments, uh, well, up to five moments, five minutes um, per presentation for any any comments or questions uh, filtered through me. So there's a lot of um, lot of uh, a warm appreciation coming through for, for both of your uh, contributions, Elizabeth and Carolyn. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at the chat. I'm sure others are too, to try and see whether there are any... Uh, uh, formulated questions um, in there. Maybe I could ask a question, which was, how, how, how is it that the two of you have, have, have come together around this topic? At what point did the idea to do something jointly come about? Was it after the, uh, the, 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 you, you'd written the, uh, the poem, Carolyn, or is there a, a longer track record of, of co-thinking? That's a good um, question, Luke, because there is a longer track record. Um, yeah, we haven't got long, but, but this goes right back to a photographic exhibition I went to in London um, by a, a Japanese photograph, photographer who was given access to Frida Kahlo's house and actually photographed her clothes and personal items. And I started becoming really inspired by this and, and writing poems about Frida Kahlo. And then I'd come across Elizabeth's name um, working at Sheffield Hallam as a colleague, but never met her. And uh, Elizabeth had done some events on Day of the Dead previously. So we had a coffee together. I thought I should meet Elizabeth. I'd love to meet her and maybe we could do an event together. And to cut a long story short, we did a big event in 2018 for Day of the Dead, where um, we did exhibitions, um, we had music, live dancing, um, exhibited some of the poems and performed some of the poems. And then I continued writing the poetry to do this small collection. Um, Elizabeth and I are still working together. Um, and yeah, I hope that continues. And I have now have this huge fascination with Day of the Dead and other rituals to do with, with kind of death and the afterlife. 
Elizabeth may want to say something. That's me doing all the talking. No, no, I think I think it's <laughs> somewhere I said pretty well. Um, I think for me, it's just more like um, this idea of bringing the community together and, and, and just keeping, keeping my roots. I'm originally from Mexico. So we have been celebrating the Day of the Dead in Sheffield and other activities that we do through a community group. And it's been a really interesting experience because I think I said that before to Caroline, I don't think anyone dies in, in, in this country because nobody talks about the death and nobody knows um, uh, how to mourn and nobody knows about how to cope with uh, sometimes with loss. So, um, and this is a quite interesting tradition that we have and, and we don't see dead as something um, as the end. It's just, it's just a continuation of, 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 of um, uh, life on earth. And just having this idea of remembering uh, your beloved one that uh, passed away every year and remember them and, 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 and really celebrate their lives. That's, that's what you do. So it's, it's not a sad occasion. It's not a gory occasion. It's not anything horrible. It's just a good day to sit, stop and think about how wonderful your life is that you had them in your life when they were around. Okay. And and it's a it's a it's a good way of of remembering them and honouring them. Okay, I've been asked a question to pass on in the chat, which I think ties into to what you were just saying there, Elizabeth. Um, uh, Folklore podcast says that the ancient Mexicans used the butterfly as a tribute, uh, and asks whether this is is this linked to the concept of them being the souls of the departed. Yeah, I think I think the butterflies have always been considered. Um, 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 the, the 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 messengers from 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 the other side, if you want to see it like that, and I think it's just because and 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 it was linked to the idea of the day of the dead, just because as it happens, they are they, the migration coincides with the with the with the well originally with the uh, 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 All Souls Day and 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 the Catholic traditions, and when the Catholic traditions mingle with the um, original traditions from from the Aztecs and other uh, uh, original groups in Mexico, then it just kind of become part of the whole the whole celebration. But yes, it's, it's quite common. I, I just I just remember that I found this little thing in my collection of things, yeah. and as you can see, it's just that it's just the death with the with the monarch butterfly uh, 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 oh, wings right. around. So yeah. Well, that, that ties me in nicely to what I'm going to take the last question. You were talking about the evolution, the way in which the, the Christian and the pre-Christian uh, motifs fit together. And then you've shown us how the, uh, the, the skeleton and the butterfly merge together. Um, the question from Ruth is, what do you think of the recent commercialization of the Day of the Dead? Um, well, I think, I think um, it's really interesting because you know what? You know where it become even worse? with the last moving of 007 that they filmed in Mexico City and then they sh uh, 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 put all this show in display for the movie. And now it's just uh, replicated every year since. But um, in reality, if you get away from Mexico City or the big cities and you go to the towns, that's when you see the real thing. I mean, in my, in my, mo in my, my mom's town and at home and in the cemeteries and in the houses, you will see the real thing. So although it's become a parade and a big commercial thing, not as much as the Halloween in the States, for example, I think it's still a very, very family uh, 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 orientated kind of tradition. I will set up, my mom will set up a little altar to remember the, 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 the dead. And people will still come to the cemetery and will still remember and will still do the, 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 the celebrate the, the, uh, the, the season in the same way as ever. So yes, it's a shame it's become a, a spectacle of this kind. But as I said, if you get away from the main cities, you will go to the, to the roots and you will see that the roots are still there. Okay, all right, lovely. Thank you very much both. We're going to move on now to um, Andrew Robinson. I've, you'll, you'll notice I'm not introducing people other than saying their names. I, I'm not meaning to be rude by that, but I'm figuring that if people want to explain about themselves above and beyond what's in the programme, they, they will do so, and better that they do so than that I try and do it for them. So uh, please take that as a, a respectful rather than unrespectful um, approach. So Andrew. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, yes, lovely. Okay, great. Are you ready to, for me to uh, begin then? Yes, please do go yeah. ahead. Okay, so I'll share my screen. Yeah. And let's share that. 
Uh, we can see you loading. Yeah, we've got your uh, image on the screen now. Yeah, okay then. Um, so I'm, I'm gonna read from notes because if I don't, I will not keep this to 10 minutes, so. Okay, thank um, you. Right. So the, uh, the small village of Eam, located close to Stony Middleton and Grindleford on the old turnpike route between Chesterfield and Manchester, is known throughout the world for a tra tragic event that took place 354 years ago, which has become part of the village's identity, literally part of its DNA. And this was the last major outbreak of bubonic plague in Britain. Over the intervening years, and especially since the mid 19th century, this event has been repeatedly revisited, reworked and represented by a succession of historians, epidemiologists, folklorists, poets, playwrights, novelists, artists, and various other people. Media reports covering the COVID-19 crisis of 2020 have made repeated reference to the Ian plague, drawing parallels with the current pandemic and the imposition of a lockdown. And these are some uh, screen grabs from uh, newspapers and, and uh, news websites. So just to uh, place Ian, give us a little bit of context, Eam here is, it lies on a um, gently sloping limestone plateau raised above the wooded Middleton Dale below and sheltered by a sandstone ridge to the north known as Eam Edge, beyond which lies open moorland leading to the Hope Valley and Hathersage beyond. And the plague arrived in, in Eam in September, early September 1665 after the town's annual wakes and as a major outbreak in London was coming to an end. It quickly spread from house to house, killing 23 people in October alone, before largely dying out during the winter months. It then resurfaced aggressively in the spring and the death toll rose rapidly, with monthly totals of 19 deaths in June, 56 in July and 77 in August, before it finally retreated with the last deaths occurring, we believe, in early November. In total, it killed around 260 people, a large proportion of the village's population. Now, the traditional narrative, which has been challenged, I have to say, in recent times, can be summarised as follows. And here I'm using illustrations from a children's guide to the village, published in 1981. And the story begins with the arrival of the plague in a box of materials sent from London in September 1665. This was followed by the infection and subsequent death of the itinerant tailor who was unfortunate enough to open the box. Then the plague spread from house to house, wiping out whole, whole, sorry, wiping out whole families. In the winter and spring before this plague returned, those with means to escape did and left the, left the town. The village was then isolated and entered its own lump, excuse me, to protect the surrounding area, led by the, Robert, the Reverend Montpesson, who you see on the left here, and also assisted by the former nonconformist preacher, Thomas Stanley. Food was left at the wells and boundary stones around the village, and the dead were buried in fields close by where they lived rather than in the graveyard uh, to avoid as much uh, contact as possible. Um, the holding of open air church services took place in nearby Cooklet Delf to maintain isolation. And towards the end of the outbreak, the rector's wife, Catherine Montpesson, passed away. Uh, and then the other main sort of focus of the story is the very, very high death toll of 260 villagers. Now, this narrative, interestingly, maps out a kind of local geography of the plague across the village and the surrounding landscape, from the cottages where the plague broke out, to the delf where the church services were held, and the graves, boundary stones and wells surrounding the village. Over the last 200 years, local historians, almost all of whom were residents of the village, have published accounts of the plague, which have also doubled as tours and walking guides, thus directly linking the memory of the plague with specific sites and inviting visitors to tour the village and this haunted landscape. And you can see a selection of them here. 
These guys have had a these guides have had a lasting impression being reprinted in many editions across the decades. The earliest and probably the most influential of these, William Woods, The History and Antiquities of Eam, with a minute account of the Great Plague, was originally published in 1842 and ran to at least eight editions across 60 years. From the third edition onwards, Woods' guide included illustrations from photographs by J. A. Warwick, which provided a visual grounding to his dramatic and evocative retelling of the plague story. Now, these illustrations reveal the plague houses where the tailor lived and where the plague first broke out. Montpesson's well. Look at church where the um, outdoor services were held. Riley graves on the edge, in a field on the edge of the town, along with the churchyard and Catherine Montpesson's tomb. Now, the view of the plague houses on Church Street becomes the, the dominant representation, really, of Ian, and the re repeated reworking of this view across the last 200 years seems to haunt retellings of the event and come to stand for a representation of the village. The earliest known version of this uh, view is a pen, in, pen and ink sketch made by Sir Francis Chantry, RA, on October the 20th, 1815 which may well have been the basis for the engraving included in the third edition of Wood's Guide, which we just saw previously in 1859. Chant Chantry's sketch was later published as an engraving by W.B. and George Cook in the popular collection of Peak District Views entitled Chantry's Peak Scenery in 1886, which was produced for the growing tourist trade of the late 19th century. The popularity of the picture postcard and growing tourism led to numerous versions of this view spanning over a century, most of which were made from almost the same viewpoint. Very, very few took an alternative viewpoint. Here are just a few, uh, a closer view of the Taylor's cottage, or at least the cottage where the Taylor was, was living, allegedly, I suppose. Um, and only a few deviate in this way. Uh, we also get uh, many postcards of other key sites linked to the plague, such as Cluckett's Church, the annual Plague Sunday uh, service in the Delft. Interestingly, when you review these, uh, it's surprising how many, or not if you live in Derbyshire, uh, how many of these uh, people have brollies, uh, even though they take place uh, in the last, on the last weekend in August. As uh, you can see, two of them there, uh, with many umbrellas. Uh, we get postcard views of Montpesson's well and the Riley graves and also postcards of uh, Montpesson's chair which he apparently used and which um, I don't know if it's still in the rectory but was uh, traditionally in the rectory. Multi-view postcards of Ian also include uh, a selection of plague sites and the same sites are often located within the geography of the village on maps that are published. And you can uh, see maps from across the years. I've got a map here from uh, the story of Ian Plague by Clarence Daniel, which was published in the, um, on the tricentenary of, of the, the plague in 1966. And this maps out, uh, along with other important local landmarks, but it maps out the, the sites that I've, I've been showing you in the images. And the inside covers of this publication from 1966 uh, replicate quite closely the illustrations in William Wood's book. Um, there are many more examples of similar representations of these locations across different publications. A particularly relevant one, perhaps, given the focus of our talks today, is the last in a three-part series of graphic novels published by DC Comics in 1997, which used Ian as a backdrop for its ghostly narrative, incorporating many aspects of the plague story. This series entitled Destiny, a chronicle of deaths foretold, weaves a story of a ghostly stranger revealing a series of haunted tales from three different visitations of the plague at different points in history. The third of these stories is set in Ian, and includes many of the key elements of the story, including the death, 
George Vickers. Have you seen with his box of fabrics? The rector and his predecessor trying to persuade the villagers to uh, isolate. And other locations that you would recognise, such as the church and the couplet bell. In conclusion, then, um, these representations of key plague sites endlessly repeated across numerous versions of the plague story seem to continue to haunt the landscape of the contemporary village, not least through their physical manifestation in the town's museum and in a series of interpretation boards and plaques, which provide a walking tour of the key sites today. Signage in the village during the current pandemic might suggest that uh, villagers would welcome isolation from the outside world once again. Um, before closing, uh, I'd like to share with you a short video clip which I was shown on a recent visit to the village. It uh, was inadvertently captured on a mobile phone which had been dropped by some teenagers larking about in the Delft who apparently got spooked by something. I was only able to film it off someone's phone as they were not willing to provide me with a copy. And before I show you this, I've got to point out that I can't in any way vouch for its authenticity, but you might find it interesting. So hopefully you can see and hear this. Can you, can you send me a copy of it? No, I can't do that, I'm sorry. Can I, can I video it? Yeah, yeah. Okay, um, hold on. Let me, there we go. Okay, play it. See what? Any closer. What am I looking for? What the hell is that? Dad, stop! Shit, I got my phone. Let's go! Leave your phone! What's that? Stop, 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 stop my phone. Can you go back? Yeah, sure. What is that? I don't know, but that's what I saw. Thank you very much, uh, you. Pete, Andrew. Um, I've been uh, scanning the, the questions as they've come in. So let me just um, pass on what I think is the first question that arose. Um, in your view, to what extent is Eom, a, a, as it were, a local or regional story? And to what extent is it is it adopted as a national story? Um, that there seem to be differing views in the chat on on which of those um, is the more dominant? Well, I think it's it's both. I mean, it's definitely, it, it's repeated time and time again. It's a case study for epidemiologists. And if you look at the, uh, if you look at, you know, the, the history of that, this is going back uh, at least, well, going right back to the 1720s when it was first mentioned. Uh, but kind of since I've been reading papers dating back to the 50s, and it, it's it's almost as though it comes up every, few years or if there's an outbreak of plague or an outbreak of a virus as there is currently it's revisited and it's been re revisited uh, very recently um, so I, th I think it, it obviously has I mean it's played a role in tourism it's played a role you, you know there's no the centenary the, the every sort of hundred years uh, there's been celebrations and they've raised money for the local church and, and so on and so they've invited people into the village and, and, and raised funds uh, and um, so it's got a, a local resonance and importance, but it's, again, it's got a national one, but it's an international one as well. You know, people have been researching it and it's, it's almost, I, th I think uh, the reason it attracts so much attention uh, from epidemiologists is because although so many parts of the story are actually really hard to prove and there are so many gaps in it, for something that happened so long ago, there's actually quite a lot of information available. Uh, and so it's kind of tantalizing to try and piece together the rest of the jigsaw puzzle. Uh, and it's, you know, lots of people have different approaches to try and fill in the gaps. Uh, how successful that is, I'm not, I'm not entirely convinced. Okay, um, I've got a question formulated in my, in my mind, which may not come out very clearly, but I'll, I'll do my best. Um, you talk about the sort of replication of, of, of imagery and, and the sort of force of that, showing us some, 
you know, very striking replications of particular forms of representation, uh, iconic images. Um, do you think that the, the integrity of the story of Eam is assisted by a tight control of that imagery? Which is it chicken and egg? Which comes first? Is it that something falls into a very neat pattern of representation that aids the replication of the story? Or does a tight story generate a tightness of visual representation? Oh, that's, uh, I don't know how to answer that. I think, I mean, going right back to William Wood's book, when it was first published, all of those key locations, now this is before there was an illustrated edition, all of those key locations were, were noted in the story and the story kind of um, pretty much as it's been handed down to us is there in his first edition. But the yep. interesting thing I think about the third edition is that he incorporated these illustrations and those illustrations as you hopefully I, I demonstrated have been re replicated um, I mean, Simon Norfolk, who's a well-known uh, photographer, visited the village uh, fairly recently doing a project for the Wellcome Trust. And he picked exactly the same sites. If you, you can find his work online, it's quite interesting. Kind of shot in the twilight hours using lots of flash to illuminate these sites. And he visited more or less the same sites. Um, but I, you know, I'm kind of this, I'm in early stage, in my early stages of really researching this. And I've become fascinating with just the quantity of, po I'm collecting postcards and the quantity of postcards, which just replicate, you know, over the generations, the same, the same views from almost exactly the same, especially of the play cottages. And what's interesting about that very first image, uh, the sketch by Chantry in, in 1815, is that it's nothing like that. I mean, it is, but it isn't, you know, it's kind of distorted space and the stocks appear now um, in a space that they just couldn't have been. Uh, so, and then people are trying to replicate that drawing and that etching um, in, in their photographs of, of, of the site. I mean, it isn't to say that there aren't other postcard views and other um, image, that there isn't other imagery of Ian, but I, I, I've become interested in just how it's represented through, through illustrations and, and photographs. Okay, well, well, thank you. Thank you very much. A lot of uh, contextual chat going on in the um, in the chat, which uh, I'm sure you'll be able to, uh, to to draw from when you get a chance to read through it. So thank yeah, you. Yeah, I'll try and answer. And there's some some interesting things there that I'd, I'd like to follow up on. I think. Okay, great. Well, thanks yeah, very much. Parcel of patterns. Yeah. Thank you. We're going to move on now to um, Carolyn. Uh, Carolyn's going to unmute. Uh, welcome, Carolyn. Thank you. Very nice to be in a room with another Carolyn. It doesn't happen very often, so um, that makes a nice change. Can everybody see my image before I start? Loading, yes, and it's on screen now. Perfect, thank you. Okay. So, few analogies can be more striking than those between our English houses, licensed for lunatics, and the vast deal of the pre revolutionized France. Between the English medical certificates of lunacy, with their concomitant order of incarceration, and the French lettre de cachet. In each case, the individual is deported and incarcerated at the will of another private individual by means of documents of which he is no, allowed no cognizance and which, as experience shows, are procurable by all who can pay for them. And in both cases, the individual is equally secluded from the world, deprived of all civil rights and left absolutely in all of his spaces at the mercy of his incarcerators without other check than occasional official supervision. And further, this, this sequestration of this, his person, this moral death, comes upon him with the swiftness and suddenness of a lightning flash. It may be his country house or amid the most important avocations of his daily life, thus entailing financial loss, possibly commercial ruin on himself and his children. Unlike Louisa Lowe in 1883, my journey into an asylum five or six years ago was under very different circumstances, quite thankfully. I'd been offered the chance to visit a mostly converted asylum site not far from where I lived by a resident with an interest in both property development and former asylums. At the time, I was a part-time real estate lecturer and finishing my PhD, which incidentally looked at asylum redevelopment, and it was an offer that was far too good to miss. 
It was a bright, sunny end of summer day as I left, driving out towards Leeds before heading north to the village of Menston. Menston, between Leeds and Ilkley, is quite a desirable area, and so I was interested to see how the redevelopment was being handled. I knew the site was well hidden from the road, so I was keeping an eye out for the turning that would signal the start of the long drive into the site. I was excited. I brought my good camera to hopefully take some decent pictures, always useful for presentations and teaching. I spotted what, what, must, have been, what, what must have once been a gatehouse to the site and turned left into the development. As I started the drive towards the site, tops of buildings started to come into view. Slowly winding my way down the entrance road, open space giving way to new blocks of flats, my excitement grew. Whole buildings appeared and I started to get a sense of the scale of the site, which was absolutely huge. Easily the biggest, most impressive site I'd ever visited. Continuing to drive through the site, my attention turned to finding the location of my meeting. It was then that the true extent of the former asylum scale hit me. I had checked the location on a map prior to setting off, this was almost a day before sat now, or I didn't, certainly didn't have one. But as I drove around, I found myself getting increasingly frustrated and anxious as I turned down dead end after dead end, wondering if I'd ever find my way to the meeting place. Eventually, I pulled into the road I wanted, parked my car, got out and stood, surveying my surroundings. The buildings were truly stunning. I found myself wondering how much it cost to buy any of the properties and what it would be like to live in a former asylum. I found myself thinking about what it must have been like to be a patient arriving at such a site, terrified most likely. My thoughts returned to the present and I took a few photographs before going to meet my asylum guide. As we walked around the site, I noticed the interest and affection for the site in the way my guide described each part. It reminded me of the affection that was evident in all of the interviews of former staff members. They all spoke of their attachment, fondness, and even pride in their asylum sites, the sense of camaraderie, friendship, and belonging. Of the social facilities on site, the sports days and the dances, the way friendships were formed between staff and patients, we continued our walk around the site until we came to a section that the builders were currently working on. It was fenced off and yet my guide was striding towards it, suggesting, oh, we can sneak in here. It's fine, he says. He knows the site manager. At this point, my professional training head very much kicks in. This is a building site and there are many, many things that can get you killed on here. Plus, I don't fancy having to explain to either my fellow real estate colleagues that I got caught trespassing or that I've injured myself while being on a building site. Too late, we're going in anyway. And I think he's just said something about getting inside the mortuary. We've sneaked in through a gap in the fencing and are heading round to the other side of the building. Upon turning the corner, a workman appears. Surely we're gonna get thrown out. But, if it, it, but it seems my guide and the workman know each other. The mortuary's open. Have a peek in there before you leave, he says cheerily. Relieved at not being escorted off the site, we continue round the building and into an open door. The mortuary. A favoured spot for urban explorers. I feel excitement mixed with apprehension. It's the health and safety conscious part of my brain again kicking in. Cautiously, I enter, not wanting to go too far in case I fall through the floor. There's no mortuary slab, but the freezers are still here. I've never been in a mortuary before, and there's a strange curiosity mixed with, well, I'm not sure exactly. Interest, certainly. I don't feel any fear. There's nothing except perhaps the condition of the flooring and the roof to be afraid of. Perhaps it's a sense of heaviness that many people pass through here, and they may never be known or at least remembered. Perhaps it's a sense of the ghosts or traces that inhabit these spaces. These sites invoke a myriad of emotions and responses and have done so throughout their lives. From tales of forced incarceration by relatives to unmarried mothers to the scandals of the 1960s and 70s, these institutions often carry a particularly negative and st stigmatized image. Many people state that they would not or could not live in one, scared of the ghosts that they perceive haunt these places still. 
posing the question of, would you live in a converted asylum, which I happen to say is one of my favourite questions to ask people on meeting them, um, to real estate and geography students each year usually gets a very varied response, as does the question of whether these sites should be developed and used for something else, and if so, what that might be. Real estate students often, but not always, look to the potential value in the sites, the aesthetics and the fact that people want to buy such historic places, something that their professional counterparts also exhibit. And yet there are those real estate students who are also uncomfortable about these places, again, as with their professional counterparts. Geography students equally display mixed views. Similar mixed responsive responses, both positive and negative towards the sites, their histories and their reuse are to be found with heritage bodies and planners. Most agree that new uses should be found for these sites where possible as a way of preserving the buildings at least, but this is usually considered as an aesthetic choice only even by those heritage bodies who could be assumed to also be interested in preserving the history itself, not just the physical buildings. Most, when asked whether they think the past lingers or a stigma exists towards these sites, provided mixed and contrary responses. From developers to heritage bodies, planners and owners, many assert that no, things have changed and there is no stigma, particularly when speaking in their professional capacities. But when you poke a little deeper, they reveal their unease or uncomfortableness towards these sites. They become more hesitant when they think about the question more deeply. And yet for former staff members, these places carry different images and memories. They were their home, places they were attached to and remember fondly. They often acknowledge the sometimes outdated treatment of patients and do not totally paint these places in a positive light, but certainly they do not conjure up the image of fear that we often associate with asylums. This is a part of asylum history that is often forgotten, overlooked, or perhaps never explored. Asylum history is therefore complicated, multifaceted. They've been viewed as liminal places, places fixed between identifications if you follow Thomason, and marginal places if you follow Shield and Andrews and Roberts. The effect of their past history, I would say, is elusive, but still present. Dwelling on the negative history, these sites fascinate and unnerve us, as the numerous Daily Mail articles on abandoned sites would suggest, films and TV series also lay testament to. Perhaps a little like the Victorian freak show idea, or the original hospital visitors of Bedlam who went to view the, to employ an old term, mad people. They are sites that, like, unlike many other historic sites, provoke discussions and debates about whose job it is to remember these places and memorialise them whether they should in fact be remembered and memorialised and who or how we should address the stories of those who pass through their doors as patients. Perhaps in time these places will lose their uncanniness, their ability to fascinate and raise questions, their ability to haunt our imaginations. Perhaps one day we will feel comfortable with them, their ghosts laid to rest. Thank you. Thank you, Carolyn. I'm having a look at the um, chat just to see if there are any uh, questions that I can pick out uh, for you. Um, mixed opinions as to whether or not any of the uh, audience would like to live in uh, um, an asylum themselves. Um, I, I reckon it must be 90 to 95 percent people say no when I ask them that question. OK, OK. Um, so why would you like to live in an asylum? Um, because they're buildings and I don't believe that buildings um, retain traces of their past and having been in a few converted ones they are absolutely stunning beautiful sites and that I personally think that they should be reused in order for us to provoke conversations about their past rather than demolishing the ball and forgetting them. Okay okay I'm still trying to uh, uh, fish out a question from the uh, from the chat view here. Um... Yeah, what about the um, trend of turning prisons into luxury hotels? I have to say I've stayed in one and I, 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 don't, have a, I don't particularly have a problem with it, but I might be an unusual person because um, I, as I say, would also live in a former asylum. So although lots of people do, um, it's an interesting one and it's one that raises large questions similar to with asylums as to whether that's an appropriate use. Um, I suppose the question would be what would what what 
could you or should you do with them otherwise? So there is an argument certainly by those who are service users of mental health services that have suggested that there should be only one asylum, former asylum left as a kind of memorial and everything else should be demolished. So it really depends on who you're talking to as to what the view is, but okay. I, I certainly don't have a problem with it. Okay, final question for you. Um, Zach asks, are professionals allowed to believe in ghosts? Ooh, <laughs> good question. Um, I don't, yes, I don't see why not. We're, we are people um, as well as professionals. We are human beings. Um, I might defer that question to Louise later um, <laughs> in a rather cheeky way because I know what she's going to be talking about. Um, I would say that we're trained not to, whether that's as academics or whether that's as real estate professionals, because that's not part of our job. It doesn't come into what we do, although there is an arm of real estate, particularly in the US, where you have to declare when selling houses and things, whether you have ghosts and murders, et cetera, in your, in your building, which we don't have the same thing quite over here. So we're not necessarily taught to or not to believe in ghosts, but it's something on the very fringes of, of what we do. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, folks, I'm proposing, because we're keeping to time, that we have that um, 10 minute comfort break now. Uh, so please, if we could reassemble uh, just after 10 past um, eight, that would be excellent. Keep ourselves to time. Um, but thank you very much to the speakers who've spoken in this first half. Uh, lovely uh, mixture of uh, themes and angles and more of the same uh, concoction uh, for the second half. So um, I'll, uh, I'll spare you the spooky creaky music uh, and I'll just uh, cut, cut my video off for 10 minutes and uh, uh, announce my return um, in 10 minutes time and we'll get back underway. So thanks very much. And uh, so I'm gonna, oh, the ghost has uh, turned the recording on. So I am in good functional company. That's great. Right. Um, that's a lovely stream of hellos from everybody. So I do feel I'm not talking to myself anymore. Uh, we are now moving on to uh, Joe. Joanne Lee is uh, out there somewhere. Joe, are you somewhere in virtual land? Excellent. Right. Well, the, uh, the digital floor is yours, Joe. Okay, I'm just going to start a slideshow and then I'm going to read. So, let's get. Can you guys see a dark lane? Yes, can see the dark lane. Excellent. Okay, that should just advance, hopefully, whilst I read something. So, I've been writing a journal about Sheffield in virus time, making an entry pretty much nearly every day since March the 31st. And in what's reached over 150,000 words so far, I've been paying attention to my everyday life and to the activities that have been going on in my bit of North Sheffield, which happens to be probably just a little way along the road from Luke. Our house backs onto a piece of rather rough woodland and a furniture factory and a body shop garage. And it's long been a site where feral activities have taken place. I found caches of lighter fuel from people abusing solvents and patches where people have dumped waste and lit fires. And I've come to feel that the place is haunted by such behaviours, which seem to erupt periodically and which press upon my daily life here. And this year it's been a group of young people who enact again such sort of Dionysian urges. In what follows, I excerpt some fragments from this very quotidian haunting um, and the pause that I make between each marks the fact that they come from different days uh, and the photographs are from an ongoing exploration of the site, which I'm calling the Project Triangulations because I happen to live in a triangular house. There are kids in the woods tonight, two girls and three boys. The boys investigate the old Anderson shelter. It draws them like moths to a flame. The young people seem to be of mixed ages, or at least of very different sizes. They hang about down behind the furniture factory. One of the girls rides her bike and practices doing wheelies. Some of the kids push, push each other about a bit. They pull up their hoods, look at their phones, ride their bikes, smoke and chatter. One smaller boy finds a big bit of concrete and grinds it against a wall. He's a plump little lad with a big attitude, posturing and occasionally gobbing. I remember such boys when I was at school. 
one of them heaves a small yellow BMX over the boundary and stashes it behind the hedge. I realise the clattering I can hear is coming from behind the house. And when I go upstairs to look out of the back window, I can see it's the group of young people again. And this time they're around the back of the furniture factory. They're passing around a roll up and out of sight, there's a bashing noise that is being carried out with some persistence as if they're trying to break something. I dither and wonder what to do, but convince myself that it's probably nothing. A little later, we go to check what's been going on and see that they've smashed off the door handle trying to break in. The police come, but there's nothing to see other than the broken fittings and a scatter of bricks and rubbish. We're rattled and we find it hard to settle. Some of the kids that were trying to break into the furniture factory hang around behind the house again this evening. They swear and shout loudly to one another. It's clear that they crave attention. I get dressed in our back bedroom window, back bedroom, and from the window, I can see that one of the workers from the furniture factory is sweeping up behind their buildings. Slates lie scattered and smashed across the tarmac. They've come from the roof for which scaffolding was erected yesterday and upon which the kids were climbing last night. In the evening, after the roof is redone, the scaffolding removed and the factory shut, the kids are back and no doubt disappointed that the extreme climbing frame and opportunity for smashing stuff from a great height is gone. They smoke and vape, shout a bit and hug or push each other about. Behind the house, we hear the shouting and shrieking that indicates the teenagers are about. Yesterday, they brought along one of those little tykes kids cars and were perching on top of it. Today, it's been flung aside as if involved in a crash and various sticks and lengths of metal are scattered from the play fighting in which they've engaged. Young people sit on the low wall behind our house. Some are familiar and others new to me. They cluster together very closely, peering at each other's phones so that the girl's long hair tangles. They accidentally bump heads, after which they shriek with laughter. The older lad is smoking weed as he lolls against the gatepost. They're there for quite a while, talking in that exaggerated way that young people do, which begs other people to notice them. During a Zoom meeting for work, I'm aware that something's going on outside. The neighbours have their windows open and are looking in the direction of our garden. I can also hear and then see a noisy little motorbike tear off. When I come out of the meeting, I discover that some of the young people who tried to break into the factory had come over the wall into our garden and even been on the flat roof of one of our outbuildings. Mike saw them out there and told them not to do it again. They're getting to be very annoying. Outside down the lane, the young people have gathered again and are shrieking. They all seem to be girls today and as the dusk comes, I can see only the glow of their phones and the red tips of the cigarettes that some of them smoke. Our evening is interrupted by a loud knocking at the door. There's a man wearing high vis who says he's sorry to bother us, but would we mind checking around the corner of our building? With his clothing, my first thought is that there must be some sort of technical issue, water or power, but it turns out that he wants us to look for his niece, who he says the police are also on the hunt for. Excuse me, I'm just going to play that again. He explains that she was one of the young people on our shed roof and in our garden last week, and he tells us that he was the person on the orange motorbike that tore off along the road that day. We look in and around our buildings, but we find nothing. He thanks us and heads off to try elsewhere. Behind the house, we see how the kids must have used the thick electricity cables that run along the brickwork to haul themselves up onto our shed roof. The cabling once led power to the industrial ovens of the catering business that was run by the previous owners. Some of the fixings have come loose and will need to be sorted. The kids are down behind the furniture factory for a while, shrieking and smoking. Too late. Dads wheel lazy circles on their scooters. One has a fluorescent orange face mask on top of his head, the moulded plastic sort that might be worn for Halloween rather than for the virus. The young people are to and fro to the factory. The lad has his orange mask on top of his head again and his friend has a black one. One long-haired girl vapes self-consciously. The pale cloud drifts slowly and dissipates. That was what I was going to read, but I've got one small short entry, which um, I wrote as the first talk began tonight. As the first talk began, I was distracted by loud voices outside. I looked out of my window and the group of young people are there. 
some illuminated by their phone screens, pushing each other about, running and screaming on the street. They head down the lane behind our house. They stand below my window. They're haunting this event. Thank you. Thanks, Luke. That's um, that, that's really evocative and, and lovely. Brings into focus the uh, the wider dimension of haunting that I was was hoping we'd get to um, as part of the journey this evening. Um, that sense that a haunt is both a, a, another word for a, for a, a particularly meaningful place. So that the, the haunt of these of these youths is the, 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 the your lane, um, but that clearly their enjoyable gatheringness is 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 less enjoyable for you and haunts you um, as a verb um, in, in a way that clearly makes you feel um, rather out of out of perfect alignment to your own place if that's a fair assumption to draw um what yeah. I'm curious to ask you is how, it's been interesting that how much how Sorry. much does this detach you from where you are how much discomfort is there um uh, at the surface if i may ask such a bold question i mean it's really odd because like I, I I end up in this two like my brain feels like pulled or my heart feels in two different directions like on the one hand I think about all that stuff that Tim Edensor writes about the sort of Dionysian urge and just the sheer pleasure of smashing stuff up which probably many of us who have been young at some point might have well enjoyed and so I kind of can see that there's this bit of rough ground it's not really anybody's it's kind of it, it doesn't really matter in any way and so I kind of partly can understand and approve of the fact that they might want to do this this thing it's their space it's kind of like a a place for them to be where particularly in Covid times where else can they be I guess so part of me feels that and then the other side of me is just like oh my god they're there again what are they doing are they going to break in are they going to smash something in our house if we shout at them will they come and like put a brick through our window and all of those kinds of you know things so I'm com completely torn a lot of the time because I value what they were doing um, in one way and hate it in another. Yeah, and, and I remember from a previous um, uh, presentation that you gave, that when you used to live down south, you lived in a tower block. Yeah. I was wondering how the sort of verticality of you having come down to earth when you like, arrived in Sheffield and now you're surrounded by all the stuff that happens on the ground level that you weren't, weren't having when you were up in the sky. Is there any of that? Yeah. It was such a citadel and you pulled the drawbridge up when you went in and then now like yeah there's no drawbridge even the fact that our house doesn't have like a garden in around lots of the sides of it we are literally on the street so people sit on our windowsills and talk and smoke fags and you know do whatever they want to do so it's it's quite in, in your face in that respect. Um, well, there's, there's a, a whole list like load of um, love and appreciation for your um, your journal and the way that in which it becomes a regular stopping off point for people of an evening to sort of check in with with uh, uh, your journal. So I'm, I'm trying to sort of uh, communicate that uh, faithfully to you. Um, I'm, I'm scouring to try and see if there are any questions for you. Um, uh, bear with me. As I say, lots of appreciation. And I think they really got that sense of the place that you were depicting and, and some of the anxiety of place um, that, you, that you mentioned. Um, but I'm not expecting any, any questions, folks. So um, you've got five seconds if you are going to put a question to Joe in the chat now. Otherwise, we'll probably move on. Uh, no more praise, but no questions. OK, well, thanks. Thanks very much, everyone. Thank, very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, right, so uh, now we're going to David. Hello. Hi. <laughs> right, here goes. Can you all see that? Everyone see that okay? Yeah, it's fine. Yeah, we can see it. Okay. Okay, the devil's elbow is the name given to a picturesque rock which stands on the brow of a high hill above the, the valley of the river Etherow on the historical boundary between Derbyshire and Cheshire. It's one of the landmarks of the Longdendale Valley and the source of many legends. 
One of these is known as the running stream. A doctor was called out one dark night to a patient living in the depths of the high peak. On his way home, he felt that he was being followed. Turning his head, he saw that his pursuer was the devil. His horns projected from his head, his cloven feet did away with the necessity for stirrups, and he lashed the flanks of his coal black charger with his tail. The doctor put his horse to the gallop, but slowly and surely the devil gained upon him. Inch by inch, the black steed drew nearer the Longdendale hack, until at length the devil, by leaning over his horse's head, was able to grasp and twist the tail of the horse. The doctor's horse, goaded almost to madness, plunged along faster than before, and in its fright it took a mighty leap into a running stream which crossed their path. The doctor and the horse, with the exception of its tail, passed over the water in safety. The doctor gave a shout of triumph, for according to the ancient laws of sorcery, if you can interpose a brook between you and the witches, spectres or fiends, you are in perfect safety. Disgusted, the devil rode off to hell with his tail between his legs, vowing that the mortals of Longdendale would have no place to go when they died, for they were far too bad for heaven and too clever for hell. Okay, so after that, I'm now going to read extracts from two personal experience um, stories that I collected in the 1990s from Longdendale res residents. The first one of which is John Davies. I've lived here at Railway Cottages since January 1929. My father was a ganger on the old Woodhead railway line. I've worked on the railway and in the signal box at Woodhead and then Crowden Station. I'm the last one here now. I've never seen a ghost, but on bright moonlit nights, I've heard voices talking outside. When I go out, it's like someone switches them off like a tape recording. People talk about the Roman soldiers that walk along Doctor's Gate and the burning lights that hover above Torside Castle. I've never seen them. But the strangest thing I ever saw was at the Devil's Elbow. It was a September night, the night of the harvest moon. I was coming back from Glossop to the railway cottages on my old motorbike. I got around the Devil's Elbow, a mile on the other side of Torside Crossing, about level with the farm, when a great black wall appeared in front. Couldn't see through it, had to stop right in front of it. I had a queer sensation. You know when all the hairs on the back of your neck stand up on end and your flesh starts to crawl. It was worse than that. And then I saw it coming slowly across the road in front of me. It was completely black and really peculiar like a huge whale. It made a gritty noise and looked like it was swimming across the road. It had a head like a whale and a white eye with a black pupil going round and round. It went right up wall up to the side like a massive black slug sliding across the road and up to the moor. So I got off my bike and I went to have a look, but there was nothing there. It had disappeared. I've been over there thousands of times, but I've never seen anything like it before or after. Well now, I'm 88, and after what I've seen, I would believe anything about Longdendale. It's a weird place at night. John Broadbent, volunteer Glossop Mountain Rescue Team. When I was young, supernatural things were always referred to obliquely. An offside sort of thing. Taut Lad was the common name. The figure you would come across on the moors. The Dark Lad was another name particularly collect connected with the moors. The Bleaklow moors were very eerie places, particularly that whole stretch from Doctor's Gate to the Devil's Elbow, especially when the mist came down. Dark lad or told lad and told woman, same thing. People not wanting to refer to them directly. So there was a funny finger crossing when you did that. Sort of crossing your first and second fingers and arcing the thumb. When we were kids, 
the wrecked aircraft on the moors were a great magnet. We were all ardent souvenir hunters. I started going up there to these wrecks with my friends from about the age of 11. In the autumn half-term holiday, I think it was either 1960 or 1961, I can't remember which, I arranged with a friend to go up to the wreck of the American Air Force B-29 Superfortress, overexposed, that lies just beyond higher shelf stones, which is just north of the Snake Pass summit. We had not been so far before, and we were to have a guide, a lad who'd already been there. The B-29 is the largest and most complete Second World War aircraft wreck in the peaks, so it was a prime bag. And since it seemed quite a long way up there to youngsters, going up there was another rite of passage for us. The guide didn't show up on the day, but he'd given us a crude sketch map. It was a bright, clear day with an early frost, but pleasantly warm as the day wore on. We made our way by Doctor's Gate and then up by Ashton Clough, taking in the Rex C-47 Skytrain that lies in that clough and eventually got up to higher shelf stones sometime after about one o'clock. And we quickly located the B-29 with much rejoicing. A picnic perched on one of the bomber's wheels was then followed by a leisurely inspection of the wreck site. The wreck is fairly compact, but scattered over several peak gruffs. As a result, we got engrossed in looking for identifiable bits of the aircraft as souvenirs. We wandered apart and out of sight of one another. Standing in the bottom of a gruff, the hags rose higher than our heads and we were eyes to the ground. We kept in touch by some desultory calling and occasionally popping up to see where the other was. I was lost to the world. Then I heard my companion cry out in alarm. I looked up, I couldn't see him. I heard him cry out again. Bloody hell, look, real fear. I scrambled on top of the peat. I saw him a few yards away. He was shouting again. Bloody hell, what is it? All the while pointing away across the moor towards that awful, wild, lonely depression and swamp called Grains in the Water at the head of Hearn Clough. And I looked and I saw, all in one instant, grouse exploding out of the heather towards us, sheep and hares stampeding towards us, and behind them rolling at a rapid rate towards us from the direction of Hearn Clough, a low bank of cloud or fog. It was how high? 30 feet maybe? Certainly higher than a house. That and the fleeing fauna would have been frightening enough. But what was truly terrifying was it was that in the leading head edge of the cloud bank, in it, but leading it and striding purposely towards us was a huge shadow figure, a man-like silhouette, but far bigger than a man, as high as the cloud bank, as high as a house. And the terror that hit me and was driving the birds and animals and my friend was utterly overwhelming like a physical blow, and I have never felt like that since. We fled, we plunged over the crags above Gathering Hill, and every time I go back and look at those crags, I wonder why we didn't break our necks. We fled in mindless terror down that mountainside towards the shelf bluff and Doctor's Gate, and all the sheep and wildlife that could run or fly went careering down with us in utter panic. And then, about halfway down, we seemed to run out into sunlight and it was all over. All the panic gone. The sheep stopped, put their heads down, started to graze. Everything returned at once to normal. But back up there on higher shelf stones, wisps of mist were still coiling around. I've left me bloody flask and snapped in up there, says my friend. Do you fancy going back for it, says I. Do I buggery? What do you think it were? I don't know, told lad I reckon. If he'd caught us we'd have been done for, I know that for sure. So I still believe. I've been back up there often. I've been on my own. In mountain rescue practice, I've been out at night on Bleaklow Head at the Wayne Stones at Torside Castle. I can't say I've not been uneasy, 
but I've never seen, since seen or felt anything untoward. I've even taken my own kids up there. But what I saw has left a deep in impression. And when I hear accounts of the big grey man on Ben McDewey and similar stories in Scotland and Switzerland, where I lived for two years, and Nepal and Bhutan, both of which I visited, I think, yes, I've seen Told Lad too, and I know exactly what it's like. Don't ask me to rationalise or rationalise it away, which is what it really amounts to. I've come to the conclusion that that sort of thing amounts to no more than a cop-out, a late 20th century defence mechanism. It's safe if it can be explained. So just to con conclude, to paraphrase M.R. James, are there here and there sequestered places where some curious creatures still frequent, whom once upon a time anybody could see? Whereas now, only at rare intervals, in a series of years, does one cross their paths and become aware of them. And perhaps that is just as well for the peace of mind of simple folk. Happy Halloween, folks. Thanks very much, David. Uh, I think you've uh, uh, transfixed everybody, uh, although the, I can see a couple of questions coming in now. Uh, so I'm just going to read this one. I haven't read it. I'm going to read it as I speak it as I read it. Um, to what extent, this is Folklore Podcast, to what extent do you think stories such as these come about from an expectation based on previous stories, possibly held subconsciously and drawn on through a Jungian collective consciousness, <laughs> and maybe combined with a feeling based on being in an unnatural looking landscape space? I find similar things with my research on black dog law. Thanks, Mark for a, a quick and easy question to answer. <laughs> yeah, um, I think, yeah, definitely um, people are influenced by their surroundings and the culture in which they've been brought up. And, and I think both of those people there that I was quoting would readily acknowledge that themselves. Uh, John Broadbent um, was certainly steeped in the local folklore of, of Longdendale. Um, he, he knew everything there was to know. He knew where all the, all the black dogs could be seen, et cetera, et cetera. But even so, I, I think it's, um, there's various theories, isn't there, in folklore to account for this, is the cultural source theory that people, um, all the experiences they have all come from sort of the cultural background. And then there's the experiential sort of theory in that uh, people have real experiences that are, inexplicable and I think I uh, I think I go with the second and that they use their you know what they know to contextualize the experiences that they've had does that answer your question it makes sense to me uh, I, 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 it's, and I, it's in the chat it says absolutely so you've absolutely yeah. answered that question so, so I haven't seen the told lad I can tell you that yeah. okay. <laughs> I'm curious to know where you got the photograph of that image like figure in the mist. Is that is that something you manufactured or, or you actually saw something of that? Type of no, that? I've been a bit cheeky there, actually, because when I reread John's account um, straight away, is I'm not trying to explain his account because that will go against everything that he was saying in his own hmm. um, story. But what what you saw there was a was a picture of something known as a Brock inspector. Have you come anyone come across that? Um, what it is, it's, uh, it's, it's an, an, an enormous shadow of an observer that's cast on clouds um, opposite the sun's direction. So anyone who who's, does a lot of walking and climbing will maybe have seen one. Um, I've seen a couple myself in the Lake District. And, and it, what, what you see is what appears to be a gigantic figure um, in the mist with a halo-like rings of coloured colored light around it. And what you're actually seeing is yourself. It's the sun reflected on the clouds and people have sort of seen these things and had the most horrendous sort of attacks of panic and sort of run off down the mountain sort of thinking they were being pursued by a giant of some kind. I'm not suggesting that's what happened to John, I don't think that for a minute, but when I when I sort of set his story running again I thought well how to illustrate this and I thought well why not use a picture of a Brock inspector so if you do google that you'll find lots of similar images online. Okay, uh, I've got a question from Ruth. Um, have you had any supernatural experience of your own, David? Not of that kind, no. I've, I've had sort of, you know, 
weird things where I thought I saw unusual figures or, you know, deja vu sort of things, but nothing, nothing of that kind. Uh, Not through want of trying, I must say. I mean, the, the, the sort of dark churchyards and misty moors that I wander around on in, in search of these sorts of things, and, I, and I never, nothing's ever happened to me. Right. Do, do you think it's possible to, in a sense, be trying too hard, that you've got to be sort of slightly brain switched off for, for these things to happen? Yeah, I think so. I think they, uh, they happen when you're not expecting them to happen. Sorry, I'm scouring the chat for questions. Can I ask a naive, broad question, which is sort of, you, you clearly have, have, have spent quite a few, few, few years collecting these stories as, as a sort of folklorist would. Um, are, are there as many stories nowadays or, or does social media sort of spread stories too quickly or does, does that help to amplify things? In what way is the pattern of scary story transmission and experience changing through our ability to converse differently um yeah I, I, the, the social media thing i, I just think I, everything else it's just eroded you know the the the, the some of the some of the, the the storytelling that they used to I mean, it still goes on but i mean a lot of the things i get sent on social media are oh i saw a funny light in the sky what do you think this is sort of thing Right. It, doesn't, it doesn't quite compare to, you know, I saw this giant figure striding across the moors towards me. <laughs> I don't seem to get those kinds of stories on social media. Yeah, I guess there's only 40, however, how many characters it is nowadays in Twitter, and, and that rather truncates the uh, storytelling uh, yeah. uh, process, maybe. I think also you've got you've got to sort of gain the trust of people and sort of the people have got to sort of feel that you, 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 you're doing a, a piece of, I don't know, genuine sort of historical research or sort of research into the local history of the area and both of those people that I quoted there it took months to persuade them to um to, to, to let me go along with the with my my old ghetto blaster and c90 cassette tape as it was back in the 1990s and it's only recently that I've transferred a lot of this material in onto um on, onto mp3 so that I can listen to it again and as I say set some of these hairs running Hmm. Somebody has put the words creepy pasta in the text. <laughs> I have no idea what creepy pasta means. Perhaps you yeah. could explain for the unenlightened. Um, I'm not sure. I think Diane is probably the best person to explain uh, creepy oh, pasta. Okay. I, keep, I keep asking Diane to give me a definition of it. Okay. <laughs> try and pop that question for Diane um, a little bit later. Passing the book into in a big yeah. style. Excellent. Uh, oh, there's more coming. What's this? Uh, uh, do you think there's something particular about moorland? Well, I would say that, but I'm biased because I like moorland. But I've always, I've always been more interested in supernatural stories from the outdoors, you know, from um, from the landscape itself, and particularly mountains, mountain folklore. I mean, um, John uh, in his account mentioned the big grey man, man of Ben might do it. You know, there are th th there are these stories attached to particular places where they seem to be they happen again and again and again out of all proportion in terms of why they should happen uh, in these particular places and also this this there is a, a sort of a, a folklore motif of whatever you want to call it about panic you know people mountaineers um, often have this experience that they think there's someone there with them when they're on their own now whether that's a psychological thing again it's a real experience but whether it's supernatural or whether it's something in there who knows okay uh, Diane has helpfully put into the chat that um, creepy pasta derives from the word copy and paste and is to do with sort of meme transmission and replication in social, social media and possibly a bit of a debasing force in folkloring and experiential contraction and laziness. I think that's what I'm picking up from that from that comment. But, uh, uh, Diane can correct me in her own in her own presentation um, if I've got that completely wrong, which I may well have. But um, thank you very much, David. Um, we're going to move on now um, to uh, my colleague, actually, Louise. Um, Louise, are you out there? Yeah. Excellent.
Can you see that? Uh, it's loading up now. I can see a ghost-like uh, uh, symbol. That's yeah. That's, that's the image. That's good. Okay, so now for something completely different. Um, I'm going to try and tell you some experiences that I had as a, a young surveyor and then later on as a lecturer and maybe finish with a creepy one if I've got time. I've got to check my watch because I always go over. But I'm going to tell you stories um, that happened to me. Now, to start with, I'm a perfectly practical, rational person. I'm uh, at the point that um, the first story starts. I was a young surveyor. I was very sceptical about anything which was supernatural. And I would just roll my eyes and go, oh, yeah, OK, yeah, whatever. So my day started is that we had a club in um, on the outskirts of Derbyshire between Alfreton. And I was asked to go and do evaluation of it because it was going to be sold and it was empty. So any excuse to get out of the office, it was a hot summer's day and in, a, in the in the Nova, I jumped, radio one on, dead loud, off I went. Arrived at this club, not expecting what I saw. I couldn't figure out whether it was a converted chapel or maybe a, a school, an old Victorian school. But it didn't really bother me. I thought, oh, I'm at the office. This is great. Got the keys and then opened the door big heavy door and as I walked in it was pitch black and as you can imagine all the windows had been boarded up because it was a nightclub it's been used as a nightclub it'd been empty for about four or five months because it had gone bust so immediately the smell hits you it's damp it smells of beer and it smells of fags cigarettes and uh, you think oh this is going to be horrendous and my boss had said to me now the lights are across the dance floor so I had to find some way of wedging the door open to be able to cross the dance floor and get to the lights. I have my uh, X-Files torch with me, which of course doesn't give the X-Files beam at all. Um, so there I was waiting. But the atmosphere in the club, I noticed, was really sort of dank. It was, it was heavy. So much so that it made your ears pop, which was really weird. So I thought, oh, this is a bit strange. I then launched myself across the, da the dance floor and eventually I found the, the lights. But it was one of those moments where you're desperately seeking to find the lights and your heart is beating so much so that you think it's going to come out your chest. It's that bad. Got the lights on and then thought, right, got to get now, get round, do what I need to do and get the hell out of this place. And as I went round, even with the lights on, it was... It was a peculiar place because even with the lights on, there were shadows in the corner. And it's one of those things where you think a shadow is moving and you turn around, you think, oh, is it mice? Is it rats? Because that's always your fear with empty property. But it was more than that. And um, this carried on and the atmosphere became very oppressive. And I thought, I really don't like this. I've got to get out of this as soon as possible. So I finished, but I knew I had to get the lights off and cross the dance floor, which meant it was going to be pitch black again. And I was absolutely terrified. But I thought, no, I've got to do it. You know, suck up the courage, get on with it. So I flicked the lights off and then I ran. And I felt as if somebody was licking at my heels, running after me, racing. And I got to sort of the door and I managed to bang the door shut. And my hands were actually shaking when I turned the lock on, the, on that club. And I got inside the car and it, remember it was a hot summer's day. And, and I was cold, I was freezing, and I was shaking. And it was one of those times when I'm thinking, oh my God, pull yourself together, woman. You know, worry, worry, what's going on here? And it was, I drove back up the M6, and I, it was coming back into my mind, the feeling, the oppression. Um, and I thought, oh, this is horrendous. But by the time I got back into Manchester, I thought I was making it up. So I sort of put it to the back of my mind. I thought, rubbish, making it up, making it up. And that was sort of my first experience of anything which I thought was remotely supernatural. But by the time I got back into the office, I didn't say anything because I thought, I don't want to look a prat. And it, it would go. So my second story comes on because I got a bit more world weary of this. And I thought, oh, and, you know, you listen to people's stories. And I was a lecturer at Liverpool John Moores. But at the time we were in um, an old building. So I'm going to sort of. Um, we, we worked on a building, uh, on a road called Clarence Street, which is, was part of the, the Georgian buildings 
in the more the conservation area. So that's an example. Great pub on the corner, spent many a happy nights in there. And that was um, very much how it looked. Um, maybe not as old as that, but not far off. And um, our building was on the corner, and that was the College of Bricks. And the College of Bricks was built on, on this road. It's a hill. It's Brownlow Hill. It's a hill. So the actual ground floor is, if you can see where the fencing is, down there was the ground floor. And the, 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 that was more or less the basement. And unfortunately, like many 1960s buildings, it had asbestos. So we were chuffed, chucked out all the lecture rooms and I had to lecture in the basement, which was the gym. Now, everybody complained about the gym because the gym was freezing. And all the kids during the summer when they did the exams all moaned because it was always freezing. And you never like going down there. You know, the only time to go down there is to watch the five aside, but that was it. So there I was lecturing in this gym, doing an evaluation lecture. And it was mid morning. And I was sort of coming to the end of the lecture and I was sort of, I was probably bored, the students were probably bored and my mind was wandering and you sort of gaze around as your eyes started to glaze over and, and I looked towards the end of the gym, which was where um, the, the, the fire doors were, which went out below, in effect below the street, but it actually was street level, it would have been the old street level of this Victorian street. And in the corner, as clear as day and as solid as anything, there was a guy standing watching me in a black Victorian frock coat, trousers and a top hat. And I sort of looked and I couldn't see his face as it was if his face was sort of blurred. It was moving. And then I sort of turned away and looked back to the students. And then my brain sort of caught up with my eyes. And I looked back in horror and there was nothing there. And I, you sort of sit back and think, did I just see what I saw? Really? So we sort of got to the end of the lecture and instead of hanging around talking to the students, I'm saying, come on, get out, get out, get out. And try to shove them along and get them out because I didn't want to be in there because I didn't want to think of what I'd just seen. So I forgot about it. Anyway, a couple of weeks later, we were on a social with uh, uh, a couple of my colleagues. And after maybe probably one beer too many, I, uh, I told some of them about what I'd seen. And these are guys, these are big builders and quantity surveyors. And, and they were, you know, sort of hard and worried guys. And I thought, they're going to laugh at me. So I told them what I'd seen. And there was absolute silence. And I thought, oh. And then there was a little bit of sort of nervous coughing and clearing one's throat. And then the floodgates opened. And these guys told me that the guy that I'd seen, they'd seen him around about Clarence Street, normally on the second floor, which wasn't good because that was my office. But normally as the, the lifts opened, the doors opened, he would be there on the second floor. But they said that sometimes he'd be half there. So it was as if his bottom half was not there and it was just his top half. And this, they, they worked out that that was because there was a house there and he was walking on, in effect, what was his top floor, whereby he would only actually come up to sort of our second floor waist height. And they told me a story. And they said there was a, there was a story about a guy in Liverpool who lived on Rodney Street and he sold his soul to the devil and he sold it for a winning hand of poker. And in doing that, he got a winning hand of poker every time and he became very rich and he became very well endowed with everything that he had through the poker. But he knew that when he died, he basically, he was, he was going to have the soul, the devil was going to come and off he went. So he decided that the only way that the, the, the devil would never get his soul is if he was never laid to rest. So he devised a plan and that in event of his death, he would be buried, but not buried. He would be in that. That was just five minutes down the road in what was the Scottish Reformation Church. And that allegedly was his tomb. And he's sitting in that tomb at a card table in a full black frock coat and top hat with a winning hand of poker. Now, because he's like that, the devil cannot get his soul because he's never been laid to rest. But in doing that, He's never laid at rest. And that's why he's up and down Clarence Street, which would have been his old haunts and where he would have played the poker. Whether that's true or not, I don't know. But I did 
see him. And I, and I did see him and it was, a, a, it was one of those double take moments and it was quite a scary moment. From and on, I'm going to finish off with, a, with one that actually doesn't relate to me as a surveyor, because I've been in many buildings and I've heard surveyors talk over the years from my own experience. They've talked to me and said, yes, we've been in buildings and yes, we've had unpleasant experiences. Now, whether it's because the walls reflect past lives and therefore they keep in the fabric of the plaster what's actually emotions. And we see that when we go into buildings, because usually they're empty and we usually we're on our own. I'm not sure, but this is a strange one. I went on holiday to a place called Docking in Norfolk many years ago, about, about 25 years ago. My husband and my small son, and we stayed overnight uh, in a, we had a, a cottage. And on the Thursday night, we were leaving on the Saturday, on the Thursday night, my husband and I were bored. So we were looking around for the scrabble in the cupboards as you normally do, and out fell a Ouija board. And my husband immediately said to me, just shove it back, shove it back, just get it back in the cupboard. And we did. And immediately we done that and we sat back down and we noticed that the atmosphere in the cottage had changed. Now I have to explain that this cottage backed on to the church in Docking. The back wall was the church wall in Docking. So there we were and that night we went to bed. And in the middle of the night I woke up and I was absolutely drenched in sweat and thought, good God, it's not that hot. And I was drenched in sweat and was lying there. And I realized that my husband was awake and he said to me, are you hot? And I said, yeah. He said, can you hear the fridge whirring down below as if it's trying to cool down? I said, yeah. He said, I've looked around. He said, the windows are steamed up. He couldn't figure out what's going on. We had a bottle of water by the side of the bed and the bottle of water just fell off the side of the bed and just threw across the floor. So at this point, he starts to get a little bit sort of worried. So I got out of the bed and ran onto the landing. And as soon as I opened the bedroom door, went into the landing, it was just perfectly normal. It wasn't hot, it wasn't cold, it was perfectly normal. Went into my son's bedroom, fast asleep. Walked back into our bedroom, it was like, it was like heat, it was like a furnace. Got back into bed and eventually we went to sleep. So the next morning we had this discussion, mm, what do you think, oh, didn't you? So that night my husband went out to uh, get chips because we were leaving that the following morning so we didn't want to cook and I hid in the bathroom I was that frightened I hid with my son in the bathroom because I was so worried about this house because the whole the whole atmosphere had changed that night we went to bed and the same thing happened again so we got up at five o'clock in the morning packed our bags and got in the car and went my husband said to me halfway up the road he said who's Ed I said what are you talking about who's Ed he said, I heard distinctly somebody shouting, where's Ed? Where's Ed? So at this point, I said, oh, no. So we were meeting friends in another area and we regaled to them, said, what's gone on? This is it. So on the Sunday, we went back to docking and we walked around the back of the house into the churchyard. And right up against the wall next to our house where we'd stayed was a, was a grave. And on it had two children, Ed and his, and his sister, who'd been burnt in a house fire in the house, which was where we'd been staying, which had been a bigger house. And at that point that we read in this off the, off the, off the, the tombstone sort of thing, the whole atmosphere in the graveyard dipped and it went silent. No birds, no nothing, it was silent. And the couple we were with said, let's get the hell out of here now because this is not, this is not right. And we did run out of the cemetery. And that was it, we, we left it at that, but my friends went back a couple of uh, months later and they went to Kings Lynn and they checked the records and they found out more about this particular house. And it seems that these children have been caught in a house fire and they both died as a result. And the house, which we'd been in, had been sort of rebuilt and it could have been related to them as a consequence of it. But what was even worse is that they went back to the church, they went back to the grave to check. When they got back in the car from seeing the, the, the grave and, and checking it all out, the heater went strange in the car and it just went so hot and they couldn't turn it off and they couldn't get the heat down. And in the end, they just drove off. And as soon as they got a mile down the road, it went back to normal. 
And that's probably the most scariest experience I've ever had. So much scary that I actually hid um, in, in this particular house because I was so terrified of what, what was out there. Um, but once again, is this, is this so, so much emotion or is it actually a haunting? Um, did my husband hear somebody shouting or was it just a figment of his imagination? We'll never know uh, and I'm never going to go back. But these are the experiences I've had. I've had more, um, but I, I, haven't got, I haven't got all night to tell you. Um, but just as a real estate surveyor, we go in buildings time and time again, and we never think twice about going into buildings. We never worry, we never get concerned. But every now and again, we do. And as a result, um, it does make you think, you know, are, do builders, whether they're modern or old, do they retain something? Do they retain the spirit that is within? And they're my stories. They're actually my personal stories um, of what I've experienced. Um, and, and, you know, hopefully I won't experience any more, thank the Lord, but they're my experiences. So I'll give back over to you, Luke, and I hope I've been on time. Absolutely spot on, Louise. Thanks very much. Um, I'm going to ask you the question that I asked Carolyn, because as Carolyn suggested, it's probably more relevant to you. Um, do you feel professionally uncomfortable talking about ghosts? No. Or does it depend on context? No, no, not, not at all. I mean, um, I, I, you know, my, my view on life is this, is that there's lots of weird and wonderful things out there. And I'm, I, I think I'm fairly open-minded now from the experiences that I've had. And I think I'll be arrogant to think that there's, there's, there's only us and there's nothing else and there can't be anything spiritual. I've been, consequently, I've been to spiritualists. I've been to, um, you know, sort of events where somebody, they, event, they are actually supposed to be talking to the dead. Um, some of them are a bit scathing. Um, and some of them, I actually think, how the hell did they know that? So no, I'm not, I'm not arrogant enough to think that, you know, just because I'm a professional, I don't talk about it because it is actually out there and it's part of what we are. Thank you. I'm going to build on a comment that um, Caroline Wise has put in the chat because it sort of fits into a question that's building in my mind. The thing that really struck me in those really great stories, which obviously were your lived experience, um, was that issue about how, once you drove down the road away from that final encounter with that sort of heating presence, eventually that heat went away and you had escaped its grip. Um, so, you know, going very much with the view that a ghost haunts a particular location and that it has a sort of territory. And if you can run away and get outside the territory, you're clear of it. And I'm just curious, and I don't know the answer to this, because obviously I haven't talked to you about this, but to what extent were you worried that you'd possibly picked up a ghost that would travel with you? Or were you confident that you can outrun a ghost because a ghost only ever stays in a single location? Were you sort of feeling for a couple of days, you know, possibly a risk of contamination or tainting from this thing that might have jumped into your car and sped off back uh, to the northwest with you or did yeah, that not cross your mind? Uh, yeah, you... I, yeah, I do. Um, yeah, there was a worry that in finding the Ouija board that we'd, we'd uh, you sort of disturb something and that it was, it, was, it was amazing that as soon as we found this Ouija board, the whole atmosphere in the house completely and utterly altered. It was bizarre. And I, and, and I did worry, I did worry as thinking that maybe, you know, you, you can, they can attach themselves to you, like poltergeists can attach themselves to individuals. Um, I don't know, maybe within docking, because it was so much attached to the house and there was the background to the house itself, that that's why it was there. But yeah, uh, without doubt, I think there's an element where you do worry that you are if you want to say for the word, sounds stupid, but welcoming it into your environment. But you've not, you've not found it <laughs> living in your spare room. <laughs> no, not at the moment. No, fortunately. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Or in class or, or, uh, or back at shoe. Well, I'm glad you haven't brought it to shoe. Yeah. Um, Right, I'm having a look in the chat, seeing if anyone's got any questions. Lots of uh, lo lots of great praise for your uh, for your um, storytelling there, Lou. Thank you, thank you very much for that. Um, I can't see any questions though. I'm just scouring 
uh, to see. Uh, I think uh, a couple of comments, people appreciating or, or, or liking the way in which we're giving the, uh, the professional perspective because estate agents and surveyors don't often get to talk about ghosts and stuff like that. So that's what we were hoping to do this evening. So that, that's great. Um, well, I, I think unless this final, this last comment that's just come in as a question, I don't think it is, but let's just check. Uh, no. Um, right. So thanks very much, um, Lou. And now, um, last but by no means least, um, we turn to um, Diane. Diane, if you'd like to load up your presentation. Uh, oh, uh, there's a message in the chat. Diane's uh, camera and mic are frozen. Um, I'll have a look at the settings, see if there's anything we can do. Oh, static. We haven't had static yet. Uh, anybody else getting static? No, everyone else seems okay. I'm looking at the settings, can't see anything. Uh, some suggestions about logging back in. Um, I'm having to fiddle with the settings. Uh, is that any better? Any coming onto the screen? No? Okay, Diane's saying she can see me. Oh. Um, uh, okay. Uh, right, so... In, uh, nothing's working here. I'm just going to check, check outside, see what that is. Sorry about that, folks. We couldn't resist that. Um, right, Diane, you can turn your um, uh, camera on now. Hello. <laughs> it's all right, folks. We haven't really got a ghost in the machine. <laughs> can you uh, hear me Diane, all right for real? Yeah, you're lovely. Yeah. Um, I'll um, turn my mic off after you've um, shared your screen, if that's what you're wanting to do. Um, yeah, I'll just attempt to uh, do that now. And yeah, we can see your screen um, in um, slide sort of view. Yeah, now we can see. Brilliant. Has, is that OK? It's all up and loaded. Lovely. Thank you very much. Right. OK, so uh, television programmes, TV programmes with supernatural themes. They've uh, spooked the nation quite often. Uh, and sometimes they've even fooled people into thinking what they were watching was real. So Ghostwatch, uh, a cult favourite now, it was presented on BBC One uh, in 1992 on actual Halloween. Uh, it was a 90-minute TV drama in the style of a piece of reality television. Uh, and this, it was a supposed live ghost investigation, but it actually became one of the most complained about television programmes of all time. Uh, and it's kind of, it's uh, an example of TV makers testing the credulity of audiences. Uh, it features a number of techniques which actually blur the boundary between fact and fiction to spook viewers on Halloween. Uh, the TV Times that's uh, on your screen here, uh, this is some publicity for the broadcast, actually describes it, and this is before the broadcast went out, it describes it as a drama, says that it's made in mock documentary style. Uh, the Radio Times described it as a screen one special drama for Halloween. So it's kind of, it, it prom they promise spooks from the outset, but they're using quite a light-hearted tone, saying it's a drama. Uh, the listings discuss presenters specifically in terms of uh, their acting roles, and they also name a number of the actors playing characters in the drama um, that you can see on screen here as well. 
so the listings arguably not too misleading. However, Ghostwatch did use real life TV presenters from children's television like Sarah Green and Mike Smith. Uh, Craig Charles was also a presenter. The whole thing was shot in a very kind of uh, news feature style. They used outside broadcast vans. And of course, chat show stalwarts Michael Parkinson was based in the studio. So all of the presenters were uh, very familiar to viewers. They were trusted by viewers at the time. In fact, many viewers believed the show was real just because Michael Parkinson was presenting it. Apparently, according to the director of Ghostwatch, even Michael Parkinson's own mother was taken in by it, which is quite amusing. Um, so even though it was billed as a drama, a lot of the 11 million viewers were taken in by this supposed live investigation into paranormal activity. Uh, it took a lot of inspiration from the Enfield Poltergeist story, uh, which if, in case you're not familiar with that, uh, it was an actual news story in 1977 uh, about a supposed haunting in a London home. Uh, news of the story was broadcast widely in British media, programmes like Nationwide covered it, it was all over print media at the time. Uh, investigator on the Enfield case, Maurice Gross, was apparently very unhappy about Ghost Watch, uh, fic fictionalising a version of it. And also Guy Playfair, who wrote a book about the Enfield case, is credited as Ghost Watcher's psychic consultant. Um, apparently, I've only just found out recently, apparently he was only added after he'd sued the BBC, but that is a story for another day. Uh, but in, in terms of comparison, the presenters of Ghost Watch, they're similarly based in a London council house. Uh, they're carrying out an investigation into supposed poltergeist activity by the presence of a spirit of a psychologically disturbed man known as Pipes. Um, in the making of Ghost's Watch, it, the um, producers, the director, they, they employed all the visual language, the presentation and techniques of a live broadcast show. And it was done in a very convincing way. And don't forget, this is a decade before pro, like Most Haunted didn't um, come to our screens till uh, uh, 10 years after Ghost Watch. Uh, and obviously other reality uh, ghost hunting shows like that uh, long after this. Um, there were some techniques also in there that kind of could have misled more cynical viewers. The presenters themselves don't be, seem to be taking the investigation terribly serious themselves at the start. Uh, they, uh, Craig Charles hides in a pantry and making banging noises and jumps out wearing a rubber mask at one point. So they're kind of playing Halloween pranks on each other. So kind of keeping it quite light hearted. It does get more tense, however, as already this kind of quite disturbing images uh, here. Uh, the tension mounts, we learn more about this pipe spirit. We see unsettling events manifest on screen. Uh, there are children manically reciting nursery rhymes, scratches appear on the children's faces. Basically, we're being, uh, we're witnessing this family being subjected to quite terrifying experiences as, as the spirit of a dead man appears to possess children as, as part of, you know, lovely family and entertainment. That bottom left image is uh, a, a quick screen grab of uh, the pipes spirit uh, captured in uh, just quickly panning past there. Uh, viewers are also asked to phone into the studio with their own ghost stories and supernatural experiences. There's a, a supposed expert in the studio with Michael Parkinson, uh, and she suggests that the show has been acting as a sort of a, a national seance. Um, and there's a, there's a, a, there seems to be an increase in calls about poltergeist activity from viewers across the country. Some people saying that they've, they've seen pipes themselves. So there are lots of elements built into to it to make the audience feel directly involved as if it's a, a real event. Uh, quite interestingly, the phone number, I, re I recognised the phone number from a Saturday kids show called Going Live. Um, it is a real phone number for the BBC, but the, the callers heard in the drama were actually actors. One of them is, is the director as well, who you hear um, in the programme. Uh, any, anyone who phoned up, real viewers who did get through were actually told that the programme was a work of fiction. They weren't kind of fobbed off on the other end.
Uh, in a kind of a dizzying climax, it escalates quite quickly. Uh, this spirit of pipes appears to take control of the BBC studios and possesses Michael Parkinson. Uh, and, and it kind of left the audience thinking that the programme itself, maybe even your television too, had become possessed, that there was really a, a ghost in the machine. Uh, but interestingly, this apparently live broadcast, I didn't know till recently, actually took six weeks to complete production. So a long time for something that apparently happens over an hour and a half of screen time. Um, due to its convincing nature, it got quite an unprecedented reaction from viewers. There were an estimated 100,000 calls to the BBC about the show in total. Despite the fact that they'd build it as a drama, despite the fact that they'd, play, uh, they'd broadcast it well after the watershed, viewers were still outraged. Some people phoned the police about alleged events in the programme. Uh, some people claimed their children were too scared to sleep. Um, my kids were terrified, said Mrs. Valerie McVeigh in the News of the World, which is one comment that I quite like. Uh, and apparently the BBC received a letter from a woman asking for compensation so she could buy a new pair of trousers for her husband as he'd soiled the ones he was wearing. Uh, unfortunately, there is a more tragic side to this as well. There's a, a tragic event that kind of fueled a media attack on the programme was the suicide of one teenage viewer called Martin Denham who was 18 years old uh, and he hanged himself near his Nottingham home five days after the broadcast uh, and his parents complained to the Broadcasting Standards Commission saying that the uh, ghost watch the programme directly caused their son's death. Uh, the, the commission now Ofcom, they ruled that the BBC had a duty to more than simply hint at the deception it was practising on the audience. They said in Ghostwatch there was a deliberate attempt to cultivate a sense of menace. And in fact, uh, there was a study in the British Medical Journal as well that later actually reported cases of post-traumatic stress uh, in children who had watched the programme. So. Uh, According to the evidence, it had some very real effects on, on some people who watched it. Uh, there is a rule about parano the paranormal and the occult in the Broadcasting Standards Code uh, that things like this shouldn't be shown before the watershed. And like I said, Ghost, Ghost Watch was after the watershed. But Ofcom also say, ensuring it's clear to viewers whether or not a programme is intended for in entertainment purposes can be a fine judgment. It must be made clear to viewers. So it, it kind of suggests that this is the tone of, of uh, the kind of billing of it, or that the BBC didn't maybe get this quite right or the clear enough. Um, so maybe that's where they went wrong in terms of the controversy but despite that over the years because of the um uh, how well the program was made how well it was put together ghost watch has gained cult status it's got fans including Darren brown jonathan ross and the league of gentlemen's mark gattis um, and i think a couple of people have already mentioned deadline inside number nine in the chat gattis's uh, colleagues uh, from the league of gentlemen reese shearsmith and steve pemberton wrote 2018's Halloween Inside Number no. 9 special, Deadline, uh, which is quite interesting to take into account alongside Ghostwatch. I mean, they must, they, I mean, I don't have the definite evidence for this, but they must be familiar with Ghostwatch. Um, Deadline was billed and presented as a live broadcast. Um, it was even, even more so than Ghostwatch, um, to be honest, in the way it was presented. Deadline started out as another typical episode in the fictional drama series. Uh, but less than five minutes into the program, the sound dropped out, continuity came on and uh, apologized for the problem. And then we cut to the actors apparently waiting around on set, confused about whether they're actually on television at this point or not anymore. It seemed like we were watching CCTV footage from their dressing room. Uh, so these seemed like very real disruptions, these kind of mysterious glitches. Uh, and an interesting use of audience participation, they didn't have a phone in like Ghostwatch, but the stars actually took to Twitter, uh, as many of you probably doing now while we're doing this kind of thing. Um, they took to Twitter to check what was going on. Uh, and Mark Gattis uh, was one of the first to tweet them back in real time. 
Uh, and it actually helped to persuade the viewers of the reality of events. Viewers believed that they were witnessing a genuine disruption to the show. Some people interacting in real time with the actors on Twitter. Some people simply thought, oh, it's gone wrong. I'm going to switch channels. I know people who did that and missed the ending. Uh, for those who did carry on watching, the broadcast itself, like Ghostwatch, seemed to become possessed itself by malevolent forces. Uh, so television uh, has the power to convince us that there is a ghost in the machine, it is a ghost box in itself. Uh, Deadline, over 25 years on from Ghostwatch, using elements of audience interaction in a similar way to fool us. Um, and in the spirit of our, our Halloween mischief, I, I look forward very much to whatever the ghost box has in store for us next. Thank you very much. I will let... Uh, that's, I'll stop my screen share. Thanks very much, Diane. That, that was great. Um, and um, Andrew, who you heard from earlier on, is, is saying that his broadband went down completely when we started to do that prank. And I think he's, he's quite freaked out by um, how it all went about. <laughs> oh, so, um, uh, sorry about that, Andrew. Um, but uh, that, that was great. And thanks very much for sort of pulling everything together and also putting up with my desire to try and do a very lame imitation of... Uh, uh, an aspect of <laughs> the genre that you just uh, uh, any, skillfully taken us through. So, joining um, in any mischief is is appealing to me. Yeah. That's fine. <laughs> um, I'm scouring for, um, for 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 quotes, and uh, um, someone's mentioned, of course, that there's there's pedigree to this. The Orson Welles um, War of the Worlds radio broadcast in the 30s, causing loads of panic um, because of the the way in which people are taken in. By the, by the style of presentation. So if you simulate a news broadcast, people will react to it as if it's real. When you very helpfully in your, in your talks showed how much converse signaling there was in TV Times and elsewhere to say, this is a drama. But even so, if you, if you use the, you know, the, the medium becomes the message or whatever the expression is. Um, yeah, the, and, and especially, I guess, there were, even in the early 90s there were still only a few channels there wasn't there's all the streaming options and all that kind of thing so there was a still chance of people would be flicking around and might just start watching yeah. 10 minutes into the program so yeah they wouldn't have necessarily read all the the listings yes i've got a question come in from um, paolo he says is there a line of thought that people who watch spooky films or shows are more interested in the paranormal if they later if they have later experiences, does that distort how it is perceived academically? Uh, so people who, who, who like watching spooky shows, does it affect how they analyze these things as? That's really interesting. If, if you watch as many horror films as I do, the when when horror nerds are portrayed in spooky things, they tend to be the more cynical, to be honest. Um, they tend to be the ones of oh well if it was if this is a horror film this is what would happen um, so I mean I'm I'm certainly interested in that kind of thing but it doesn't mean I necessarily believe in it more but I'm interested in its portrayal um, I like the idea that there are spooky things I mean well, I remember first watching Ghost Watch oh gosh how old was I Oh, I was a teenager. I can't remember exactly, but I remember wanting to be spooked by it and wanting to be taken in. But the second the credits rolled at the end and I saw pipes played by and I, I was like, oh, obviously it's not real. And then I couldn't kind of couldn't believe the news the next day, you know, the furor, because I thought, but there were credits at the end saying who the characters were played by. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, yeah, sorry, I've, I've wavered off topic from the question because I no, just no, I think I about horror films. No, <laughs> I imagine you become so familiar with the sort of standard ways of structuring those those portrayals that you do become more cynical because you can see all the ploys and you go, oh, that's one of those and one of those. And so on yeah, because so there's a certain way that nar those narratives tend to play out and tend to pan out. And that's why um, films like Wes Craven's Scream was was really interesting example because it, it kind of, writ large the the narrative structure of well don't leave the room don't say i'll be right back because mm. you'll be the first person to die or don't have sex if you're a teenager in a horror film because you will you know and mm. and it's it's nice when anything um plays with the structure or plays with expectations and does something different and that's something that ghostwatch did it was it was nobody had really done that before at the time so mm. yeah 
I'm interested in people playing with expectations. I don't know, has anyone seen Host, uh, which is a horror film based on a Zoom call? Uh, that, that's quite an interesting use of the, of the format of Zoom. I imagine, uh, I watched it on a TV screen, uh, but I think if I'd watched it on my laptop where I am now in this room where I do all my Zoom calls, I think I uh, would have soiled my trousers uh, like the gentleman watching Ghost. So it was, it was really, it would be scary watched in that same format, I think. Mm. So I'm interested in people playing with the, changing the narrative format or doing something different. I'm scouring the chat for questions. Um, there was there was a query as to whether or not it was broadcast live, and, and someone else has responded to say that it was recorded, but it was presented as the you know people the audience was told that it was live, but it wasn't actually live. Um, yeah, no, it wasn't. It wasn't actually live. Uh, clarified that one. Uh, David's added the point that um, the Orson Welles War of the World thing wasn't the first of its type, and he talks about the uh, New York Sun Moon hoax of the 1880s. Uh, where the paper had, had an article saying that an astronomer had seen creatures on the surface of the moon and the paper sold out its run and you know, I don't know whether that was an April the first story that went wrong or uh, uh, or, or whatever but uh, um, you know, the, the, the Orson Welles example is interesting as well because I've, I've talked about that where I used to teach film studies and, and that's kind of something that was conflated beyond its actual effects as well because that was something that it, it didn't really create mass panic the mass panic is something that was okay. kind of uh, self-perpetuating, kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy. I think it was. Uh, they liked to think that it had had a bigger effect than it really did. Um, Kyle has commented in the chat on your on your question that you threw out to the audience as to whether anyone's seen that horror film based in the Zoom format. And Kyle says uh, that they watched it on a laptop but found it dull and obvious. Uh, but then, oh, okay. Uh, maybe they're too jaded. Um, well, we, we probably can't help you for your jadedness. <laughs> but, well, it, uh, it it did it did use it did do kind of fairly straightforward horror film things, but I thought just doing it in a different format was mm -hmm. interesting. And there's some effects on there that I have no idea how they managed to do it. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but there's all digital modern things these days. So you know, kids would mm. probably get it more. I just seen someone mentioned Antrim. That was I. That was very scary and um, is very folklory and talks about um, has folklorists talking about this lost film that they've found from the 1970s. That's like a cursed film, um, and it's it's kind of bookended with these bits of documentary from folklorists. And then you see the actual cursed film itself. So any anyone interested in folklore stuff, that's that's a good one. Okay. Well, I think that's an excellent um, pointer to what I think we must do out of a public service concern for the audience kind of thing. Andrew, are you all right, sir? Can you tell us that your broadband is working and that you are not traumatized by the experience? You need to turn your microphone on there. Or maybe we need to turn your microphone on. I'll ask you to unmute. Okay. I can, yeah. yeah, you can hear me now. Yeah. Okay. There we go. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm fine. That was quite freaky. I, I was all prepared uh, for you for your. I have your script, <laughs> <laughs> um, and and then everything everything literally died. The TV died. My computer died. Uh, the broadband was flashing red lights, and uh, uh, it was a little bit freaky. Yeah. But it's all okay now. Yeah, it's all, and, and the recording is converting. Uh, so I think it's recording to the cloud, but I've got a recording on my laptop as well. That's what I was worried about, that we'd lose the recording, but I think yeah. uh, it's safe. Excellent. So, uh, Excellent. Yeah, that was, uh, it was a bit weird. I, I thought I thought you were hoax, uh, you know, pranking me. It's a very, very elaborate joke just on Andrew. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Life's too short. Uh, <laughs> but there we are. Okay, well, um, thank you very much, Diane. Uh, I think it probably falls to me now to wrap up in the remaining um, three, three minutes. So um, thank you, everybody. Um, it's been great to have um, 100 plus people on this journey this evening. Um, so thank you very much, one and all. Um, thank you to those of you from the sort of folklorist fraternity for sticking with presentations about 
haunted survey surveyors um we, we we're very grateful to you uh thank you to my colleagues from the real estate department for coming along and bearing their soul in a way that they might not normally feel comfortable uh doing talking about ghosts and stuff um this was um a presentation as i say jointly um organized um with the center for contemporary uh, legend uh, and um the uh, shoe space and place group uh, there will be further shoe space and place group activities around this theme of haunts uh, doubtless due to contemporary circumstance they will be online uh, rather than face to face um, over the next uh, uh, nine months or so uh, I'll circulate some details of those to anybody who sends me their email and says please Luke will you add us to the mailing list um, and uh, when the recording is available um i will let everybody who's registered to attend this event know by by eventbrite um and let them know where the uh, recording is going to be hosted um if as i've said in the opening instructions and in my emails if anybody um would prefer to be removed from um the recording uh please do let me know by seven o'clock tomorrow beyond that point of time i'll assume that you are uh, happy um we also do capture a copy of the chat string which is really interesting and i'm sure the presenters will love to um, read back through that and see the comments that have been coming through live as they've as they've been speaking um that will also be you know safe for posterity but once again i should say if anybody feels they want in some ways to be edited out of that please let me know um likewise by seven o'clock tomorrow um uh, evening if you think there may be something that needs editing out of that um and really all that remains is to say once again thank you very much thank you to my colleague um charlene for um helping out with some of the um uh surveillance side of things keeping an eye on what was going on in the chat uh and trying to help me press the right buttons on time and apologies that i forgot to press some buttons at the right time but you know hey it's quite difficult so we're all learning folks and thanks very much for your time and um we're now done so um Go and go into a room and turn all the lights on and think about things that aren't to do with ghosts and uh, enjoy the rest of your evening. Thanks very much. Bye bye.